The polls are now beginning to close on the East Coast, and by tomorrow morning, if we're lucky, we should know if President Obama or Governor Romney will be our president and commander-in-chief come January. Welcome to this special ed election edition of The Big Picture. I'm Charles Bierbauer. For the next hour, we'll bring you live information and analysis, not only about the race for the presidency, but several statewide contested races as well, including South Carolina's new 7th Congressional District in Horry County and the PD. Joining me here in ETV's Columbia studios tonight is Winthrop political science professor, as well as the founder and director of the Social and Behavioral Research Laboratory, I guess that's better known as the Winthrop Poll, at Winthrop University, Scott Huffman. Scott, as, as the expert on polling, um, are we at a point, at the, even at this early hour, where we can start to feel a little bit in terms of what the expectations are both nationally and in South Carolina? Well, One of those questions is easy and one is hard. <clears throat> right. <laughs> I think we know uh, probably where we're going in South Carolina. Um, with the national polls, the, the biggest question has to do with uh, a technical concept called non-response bias. If the people who don't answer polls, if there is something specific about them that they lean more towards one party than another, then we can say there may be a type of bias. Now, it's not partisan bias, but there may be a type of bias in the polls. The best research now says there's not a whole lot of non-response bias. So even though very few people answer, it's fairly well sampled. Um, but even if there's a couple of points, uh, you know, pro-Romney, that should be built in, Obama's still very strong going in. So we're really seeing tonight uh, a kind of test of the current science of polling, if it holds true. And, and, the, and if the current science is good, it's showing it to be extremely what? Uh, extremely close. Uh, you know, the Electoral College, most of the swing states are still predicted to go for Obama. But, you know, it's within the margin of error in so many of those swing states that you only need a couple of percentage points in each to start swinging very key states. So even though you have these higher probabilities among some forecasts for Obama winning, it really is extremely close. It, and, and we won't see much of the swing states for quite some time. Let, let us join uh, now as well our colleague in our Rock Hill studios, Adolphus Belk, who is also a political science professor at Winthrop. He's the coordinator of the African America Minor Studies program there. Uh, welcome. Adolphus, you're, you're a little closer to one of those swing states, the battleground state of North Carolina. What's the buzz in Rock Hill and points north tonight? One of the things that Scott mentioned in talking about the national polls is how close things are. What we really need to be doing at this point is taking a look at those statewide polls. And North Carolina was a highly contested battleground state in 2008. Barack Obama and John McCain were separated by fewer than 14,000 votes. So just for our viewers at home, that came down to 49.9% for Obama, 49.5% for McCain. It was a really tight race. Over the last several weeks, however, things in North Carolina have been trending toward Romney, and the governor seemed to be so confident that they started pulling some of their resources out of North Carolina and putting them into other battleground states where they felt like they needed more help. So was that confident or overconfident? I think for them, they're chalking it up to confidence. Uh, North Carolina is looking like it, it'll go his way. But the final thing really comes down to the turnout. We've talked a lot about polls over the last two years, really looking at this contest and looking at all the candidates that were competing in the Republican field. Now we're down to two campaigns and which of those campaigns is best situated to get their people out today. And the turnout from all I'm hearing and, and anecdotally in my precinct uh, was pretty high. We, we get a sense that it may be high nationally. Uh, up your way, same thing? Yeah, and it's, and it's a very good thing, too. Um, there was some concerns about contracting early voting periods in a couple of different states and about absentee ballots and how those things are going to be negotiated. One of the things we've learned already, though, is that there are a lot of people who have participated early, and there are a lot of people who are going to the polls today and braving the cold to make sure that their ballots are cast. All right, Adolphus, we'll be back with you shortly. But also here in our Columbia studio is Furman political science professor and the chairman of ETV's commission, Brent Nelson. Brent is joined by a couple of uh, University of South Carolina broadcast students who are tracking the trends of social media this evening. Brent? Thank you, Charles. Yes, I am here with two students from USC. They're both broadcast students. On my right here is Jenny Knight, and next to her is Amit Kumar. Uh, they're here to talk about social media, what's trending on Twitter, what's looking good on Facebook these days. And so we, we decided to start with 
voting lines and broken machines. And Jenny, what's going on around the country in terms of these delays in voting? Long lines everywhere. We've seen it particularly in Florida, but also in the Northeast. Uh, Hurricane Sandy's really affected all of the voting up there. New York and New Jersey, people have been able to vote in any precinct that they want to, anywhere they can get to. They've been voting in tents, just trying to get their vote out. Still high turnout. So this year's October surprise being Hurricane Sandy, causing problems up there. Uh, Amit, what's going on here in South Carolina? Well, you know, Brent, we're really seeing the exact same thing here in South Carolina. Here in Richland County, we've seen delays of two, three, four hours just to cast a vote all over the county. Greenville, Charleston, same thing. Um, as far as reasons, we've got some pretty high turnout in the state, um, some faulty machines, a question of whether there are fewer machines here than in 2008, but all in all, some pretty long lines today. So if you're in line, stay in line uh, because you'll be counted. But uh, that's the picture from around the country. Charles. Thank you. The only statewide issue on this year's ballot is a referendum asking the question of whether or not the governor and the lieutenant governor should run on the same ticket together. We look at why it's important and what it could mean to the voters of South Carolina. Voters today noticed they aren't only voting for their next president. A referendum on how the lieutenant governor gets elected will also be on the ballot. Currently, the lieutenant governor and governor are elected separately, but a change would mean that both would run the same ticket, meaning they most likely would come from the same party. But why change that now? It makes perfect sense for the governor to have a unified executive branch. Dr. Mark Tompkins is an associate professor of political science at USC. He says by having both the governor and lieutenant governor on the same ballot, it eliminates a possibility of having a lieutenant governor who has different political views from the governor and other legislators. If we select a lieutenant governor at the same time we select a governor, presumably we're going to get somebody who's on the same team as the governor, who shares their values, and so if something happens to the governor, the transition to the new leadership will be uh, relatively uneventful. Dr. Tompkins added, it takes away from having a long ballot where people are voting for candidates who they may know little about. We have what amounts to a long ballot. Uh, we elect nine constitutional officers. I often challenge my students to tell me who the Comptroller General is and what Comptrolling the General does when he is Comptroller General. For now, Dr. Tompkins says we will continue to have a lieutenant governor as the state has always had. We have a long history of having a lieutenant governor, so maybe we'll keep it, and that's the direction we're going. Now all that is left is to see if South Carolinians will keep things the same, or if change will come to the state. For The Big Picture, I'm Carlos Villalobos. Question of management style. The governor's hollow and they need more assistance. Well, we've got, we've got Lieutenant Governor Glenn McConnell with us here. We are chatting around the table as, as, the, uh, as the tape is playing. So, so you're the man to address this. Not only do you sit in the Lieutenant Governor's seat now, you've helped draft this, this proposal. Uh, you would not be immediately affected by it. So what is your sense? What's, what's the argument uh, in its strongest form for not electing these two offices separately? For not electing them separately? It is the uh, question of the management of style of of government and that is that the governor contends with the larger government that they need a right-hand person and this person would be chosen by them and would answer to them. The counter argument to it is that you take away the public uh, being able to participate in choosing the lieutenant governor but the basic difference between the two propositions is this under our current 1895 constitution the lieutenant governor is kind of quasi executive and quasi legislative preside over the Senate. No person presiding over the Senate should answer to the executive branch of government. And that is, right now, they answer to the people directly by election. So, How, how does that differ from the Vice President of the United States well, presiding that's more, over the U.S. Senate? That's, that's ceremonial there. Uh, the, in the South Carolina Senate, uh, who you recognize, a lot of times it's very important who gets ordered in what succession. Uh, I run uh, the Senate as a presiding official on a very nonpartisan basis, and I follow the strict rule. Whoever's up first gets recognized first, not who I might particularly like. So it's a more hands-on job than what we yes. see in, in the U.S. Senate. So uh, to, to pick up on your first point, whom do you answer to? I answer to the people, not to the governor. Uh, I answer to the people because the lieutenant governor is elected by the people. 
And and you you though are a creature of the legislature. You stepped out of the legislative That's role correct. to assume this because of uh, other events that that transpired. Um, if the change is made, will that enhance the two bodies, the executive and legislative, working better together? I don't know that it will enhance them working better together. Uh, what it does is it clarifies the lines of, of separation of power between the executive and the legislative branches. Uh, this, the, the question of how they work together depends on the style of the governor. Um, the, in the past, there's been a combative relationship which has not been productive to moving uh, big issues forward. Uh, I'm just one of those that believes, look, when the elections are over with, we need to stop the politicking and get into problem solving. But problem solving has not been, in my opinion, the forefront uh, of governing. It's become the next election. Almost as soon as one election's over with, it's got your votes in the next election. And the problem is the problems continue to pile up. Do you expect this referendum to pass? Yes, I do. And, and uh, I can tell you that because when I was senator, I polled that uh, in terms of what I call issue surveys. I sent on an annual newsletter. It was overwhelmingly in support of that style of management. I have heard from some people saying, look, don't take away my right to vote. What races have you got your eye on tonight? Well, of course, the presidential race. Uh, obviously, uh, where the country is going, what is the philosophical direction of the, of the country. That, to me, is the big race. Down there, obviously, in my old Senate district, is to watch the two battle out uh, over that particular Senate seat. But uh, I think in South Carolina, I think uh, South Carolina will go Romney. Uh, the question is, where will the rest of the country go tonight? I watch these polls. I hear the comments about depends on certain assumptions based in those polls on, on what plus factors and what are. We have a very close race. We may not have a close race. Lieutenant Governor Glenn McConnell, thank you very much for being with us. Glad to be with you. We thank should, you. We will know some things before the night is over. That is correct. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let me um, let me go back to, to Adolphus up up in Rock Hill. I want to shift the the discussion to some of the uh, local races that we are looking at. Adolphus, where do you think the critical ones are uh, in the legislature? Well, one of the ones that's going to interest people in this area in particular is the race involving State Senator Wes Hayes. Uh, he hasn't been opposed in, in quite some time, and now he has an opponent who's running as a petition candidate, unable to get on the ballot. And what we find in this district and a couple of districts across the state is that there are petition candidates that are kind of darlings of the Tea Party and supported by groups like, for example, the Palmetto, the, the Palmetto uh, Liberty Pact, and they're running to the right of some Republican incumbents like Senator Hayes, like Speaker Harrell, and those persons have been identified by the Palmetto Liberty Pact as being insufficiently conservative, Republicans in name only or, or, or rhinos. And so they want to see candidates come out of these contests that are more committed to the conservative values that they espouse, lower taxes, school choice, reforming unemployment compensation so that people who are fired from their jobs no longer are eligible to receive benefits. So those are some of the things that I'm going to be watching for tonight. Well, you touch on one of the anomalies of, of the election here in South Carolina, and that is in fact, those, those more than 200 candidates who were thrown off uh, the ballot, some of them have gotten back on and are, as, as you described in, uh, in the one instance there, a petition candidate. Uh, there's a, there's a, a race down in this part of the state uh, where Senator Jake Knotts is being challenged by uh, Katrina Sheely. She is a Republican, but she's one of the, uh, the petition candidates. So you've got a Republican running against a Republican, Scott. Uh, that's intriguing to start with. Uh, but, but what more does it tell us? Um, in fact, many of these races are actually Republican against Republican because there was a strong push. As you know, in 2010, we all saw the Tea Party wave. And in many places across the country, the Tea Party kind of receded a little bit, but not in South Carolina. In South Carolina, the Tea Party remained very strong. However, it became fragmented. If you look back at our, our presidential nominating process, the Tea Party broke up and they would uh, sort of endorse different candidates. But it was still quite strong. And that pushed to the forefront a bunch of candidates who wanted to challenge established Republican incumbents. But there's serendipitous uh, happening for incumbents 
uh, where you had to sort of file twice, online and in paper, if you were going to challenge, knocked a bunch of people off the ballot. And Senator Knotts is a classic example. He was benefited by this and made darn sure that it was that there was no fix that came in to uh, to allow a, a second primary or something else. And so in his situation and in many others, including the race in Senate 15 that Dr. Belk was talking about, you do have incumbent against incumbent. And some of these are a challenger uh, from the far right against a mainstream Republican, but there are county council races and other races around the state where you have a far right incumbent being challenged by a middle of the road Republican petition. Let me ask you both quickly, uh, Scott first and, and, and then Adolphus. Is there potential that the, the makeup of the Senate shifts from being what is right centrist with some collaboration among the moderate Republicans and the Democrats to one that is far more to the right if, if some of these candidates who are, are more right than right Republicans are elected? Only a handful of the petition candidates are going to win. It's not going to be a large scale overturning simply because most people are going to be comfortable with their incumbent. They're going to see themselves as Republican. They're going to continue to vote Republican. But a few are going to get in and that might change the makeup. But also some of the mainstream Republicans are going to get the message and they're going to move a little bit to the right. So it will change the makeup even though not a huge number of petition candidates will be winning. Adolphus, any tectonic shift? Incumbents are incumbents for a reason. They typically deter challengers. They're able to raise more money than their challengers. They have a record to run on in their district. They have name recognition. So those are some of the factors that contribute to the enormous success rate that incumbents have when they run for office. The thing to watch for would be to see if these folk can, and, and by folk I mean if the challengers that are more to the right are able to develop some sort of critical mass where they could vote as a larger block within the Republican coalition in the legislature, that would mean more trouble in terms of governance. But as Scott is suggesting, the chances are really slim right now to be victorious tonight. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's rejoin uh, Brent Nelson and, and his team uh, over on the social media front. Brent? Well, Charles, we're going to take it back to the, the national picture right now. Some of the networks are beginning to call some states uh, for mostly Romney right now, some for Obama. Uh, one thing that is common about all of these states is that the candidates weren't there today. And that's because they aren't considered the battleground states. But where were uh, our candidates today? Amit, you had the, uh, the Democrats. Where were they today? Well, the Democratic ticket today, Brent, um, Joe Biden, he, made, he voted in Delaware this morning, made a quick stop over in Cleveland, um, just a battleground state of Ohio. Obama, on the other hand, the president has been lying low. He has a superstition, always plays basketball on election day, so that's what he did. Went into a campaign office, made a few last-minute calls to voters. Um, but for the most part, the Democratic ticket has been taking it pretty easy today, just relaxing. The whole basketball thing, that's what you find out on Twitter. That's what you find <laughs> out. That's what people that's are right. talking about. And Jenny, how about the GOP? Where were they today? Still on the trail. Uh, Mitt Romney started off voting in Wisconsin. In Massachusetts and then took a st uh, stop in Cleveland and then in Pittsburgh um, back to Massachusetts tonight and then um, Paul Ryan started out voting in Wisconsin stop in Richmond and back to Massachusetts with Mitt Romney so Pennsylvania Ohio Wisconsin that's the places where our candidates were today those are the places where it's going to come down to those states uh, and we, we won't know the result until we know some of those states results Charles? Thank you, Brent. Uh, two of the states that the candidates were not today are Kentucky and Vermont. Those are some of the easy ones. And according to the Associated Press, uh, the AP is calling Kentucky for Mitt Romney and Vermont for Barack Obama. No sure trends in that. Joining me now uh, on set here are Wesley Donahue, who's with the Senate Republican Caucus, and Tyler Jones, who is with the, and the prompter doesn't move, so I apologize. Uh, Tyler. House You're Democratic the House Caucus. Democratic Caucus. That's right. Caucus. That's right. Ah, technology. So <laughs> let's let's stay focused a little bit on local races as we were. Talk talk initially about uh, anything that's going to be worth noting in the legislature. Well, I think we've got some big Senate and House races tonight to look at. I don't know that we'll have results until in the morning, unfortunately, for some of them just based on uh, some long lines in Richland County and other places around the state. Uh, but as far as the House goes, we've got five major uh, races that we're looking at. Two in Richland. Beth Bernstein taking on uh, Representative Joan Brady. That's going to be a tight one. Uh, Kirkman Finley uh, versus uh, Joe McCullough for Jim Harrison's old seat. Uh, Ted Vick uh, up in uh, Chesterfield is, is fight for his political life. Uh, Dorchester County, Patsy Knight's taking on a good, uh, good challenger. Uh, and Ed Carter and down in Abbeville, uh, we've got uh, Representative Paul Agnew 
uh, has left, has, has retired, and uh, looks like the Republicans might actually pick up that seat. So we're looking at five main House races tonight. Similar? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in the Senate, we got five or six races. I think what you're going to see at the end of the day is a couple of Republican House pickups, a couple in the Senate, too. Obviously, the big race everybody's paying attention to here in the Midlands is Katrina Sheely, Jake Knotts, as you just, you just pointed out. There's a huge race down in Sumter, Thomas McElveen, Tony Barwick. There's a big one up in the upstate, Larry Martin and Rex Rice. Uh, Glenn McConnell, who just was sitting here, the, the race for his old seat down in Charleston, Paul Tinkler versus Paul Thurman. I think in the end of the day, you're going to see two to three seats being so picked there, up for so the there Republicans. Are, there are some, some competitive yeah. seats. Um, come, come back to the Sheely and Knotts race, because it's, it's one that we're focused on here in, in the Midlands. It may not matter as much outside, but it is uh, Jakey Knotts, who's always sort of a, an attraction in one form or another. Um, if, if Sheely were to beat him, mm -hmm. and neither of you may think that's going to happen, what would it say? Well, I mean, it, it'll say that the, the, the real conservative side, the Tea Party side, has taken over the Republican Party in South Carolina because it's such an uphill battle for Katrina Sheely right now because she is a petition candidate. I, for one, don't think any petition candidates are going to win because of all those straight party voters. You've got people standing in line for two or three hours, four hours, some. They're just going to go in, I'm sick of this, I've been waiting long enough, hit the button, boom, be gone with it. But, yeah, I think it shows a lot. I think it, if she can overcome all that, then the party really has gone to the right. Similar? Yeah, and I think actually Mitt Romney is going to win this thing for Jakey Knotts. I think the straight ticket Republican vote in Lexington County is ultimately going to bring him over the top. Katrina Sheely would be the most conservative member of the South Carolina Senate, and I don't even think Lexington County is that conservative. And, and people are standing in line two, three, four hours. I got by in an hour and a quarter, and I thought that was pretty, pretty good. Lucky, but but yeah. turnout is, is high, it seems. Everyone that I'm hearing from says it's high. Well, it's high for, for or, two. Or is it high because machines are breaking well, down. Well, that's what I was going to say. there aren't very many. I, I've been at the polling places at 6.30 this morning, and uh, turnout is extremely high, uh, but we also got shorted uh, voting machines in Richland County. So I think the lines you see uh, are up to four, maybe five hours in some places, and that's because people are very excited about the local races. We've got the penny sales tax referendum here in Richland County, but also the presidential election, and there just aren't enough machines in Richland County. And uh, that's going to be the, the big debate tomorrow. Well, the Republicans and Democrats, we will agree on this one issue. We don't agree a lot, but, I mean, it just sucks what's going on here in Richland County. People are waiting way too long. It's mm -hmm. freezing cold out here for South Carolina standards. So this is a problem we've got to get fixed. Uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, the penny sales tax for those who aren't in this part of the, uh, the state. It's, it's ticketed for buses, for transportation, local transportation, uh, Richland, Richland, Lexington. Does it pass? Absolutely. Um, it's got the, the support of Mayor Benjamin, Sheriff Leon Lott, and a lot of local leaders. Uh, the, the citizens of Richland County know that, that we need this, uh, and so I think, I think it'll pass uh, overwhelmingly. I, I think he's right. I think it will pass, unfortunately. I mean, the last thing we need to do is raise taxes by 12 percent here in, in the Columbia area, but, you know, our liberal city leaders are going to force it on us. So you say a penny and you say 12 percent. <laughs> yes, sir. Right? I mean, I, we're both technically right. <laughs> hey, it, it'll, it'll mean jobs. It, it it'll mean jobs. It didn't pass last time, and it, was, and it was largely configured again as a sort of an omnibus package rather than a singular focus. What's changed? Uh, they've run a great campaign. They've put a lot of money into this race, and I think the, the opposition to it uh, came in a little bit too late. And, and didn't have enough funding to really get their message out. So I think it passes overwhelmingly. Yeah, I, I agree. I, in fact, I didn't see any opposition against it. I thought that the campaign against it was just absolutely pitiful. And you got yeah. a bunch of city leaders like the Chamber of Commerce, for some mm -hmm. reason, you got business leaders pushing the sales tax. Makes no sense to me, but I think you're right. I, I wanted to ask you one other thing before we move on. We've got Amit yeah. and, and, and Jenny over here looking on and the social media implications. And I know you use this a lot in the campaigns yes, that, that you're involved in. Is, is that a, a sea change in the way we conduct campaigns? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm really excited because last cycle you saw it really at the top, the higher levels, U.S. Senate, presidential. But now for the first time that I'm seeing, you see these local candidates, city council, state senate, state house mm -hmm. guys. And what's really awesome is you might not be able to reach Barack Obama through Twitter, but you can reach your state senator mm -hmm. and state house member through Twitter. And it's really fascinating. And Barack Obama can reach you through Twitter. <laughs> That's yes, right. he can. That's let's, right. Speaking of Twitter, let's, let's go back to the, uh, the Twitter patrol. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Yes, we are... Uh, Again, looking at, at some of the swing states here, and uh, Jenny has been looking at her home state of Virginia and also North Carolina. What are you seeing online there? North Carolina, not to be ignored, even though I heard the term FLOVA thrown around a few times earlier, Florida, Ohio, Virginia. Uh, North Carolina has a Democratic governor, voted for Obama last time, not sure about this time. Um, and in Virginia, a Republican governor this time, um, again, voted for Obama last time. So. 
It's a really t a big toss-up. I think it's a mixed bag from where I'm from. You said something about weather being important in Virginia. Everyone I've talked to today says it's absolutely freezing. Some some rain every, you know, in a few different cities. So hopefully that won't impede people from coming out. But history shows it usually does. Good. And Ahmet, we're looking at Ohio. Right. What people are talking about on Twitter, remember this name, Hamilton County. County um, right close to Cincinnati in Ohio, one of the most important states by far. If you do the math, Ohio is really one of the most important states in the Electoral College. And um, very close. Don't know who is going to go to Obama or Romney. People are saying Hamilton County could swing the whole election for the country. Um, also, people talking about the swing state of Florida. Long lines there today, very long lines. Um, don't know which way that's going to go either, but that's what people are talking about, Hamilton County in particular. So search Hamilton County on Twitter and you'll find all the latest news. Back to you, Charles. All right, thank you. Let's go back to his office up in, uh, up in Rock Hill. Um, we've talked a little bit about local issues here. We're going to broaden out towards, towards national issues. But I wanted to ask you uh, if, if you've got your eye on it. The 7th Congressional District, new to the state of South Carolina this year, over in the, in the PD area and, and along Myrtle Beach, uh, what are you seeing over there? Well, this is, this is um, something that our viewers need to know. When, when states like South Carolina gain in population and gain in a substantial way, it means that they can gain greater representation in the House of Representatives. And so as a result well, of the population gain the state experienced yeah. from 2000 to 2010, sorry. we gained an additional seat. That meant that it came at the expense of some other state. When we think back to the Winther Poll data that came out some time ago, it was shown that Tom Rice has something like a 13-point lead in that race. And so it's expected that Republicans will be able to pick up that seat and add to the size of their delegation to the United States House of Representatives. And what's so interesting is that while you had so many freshman members that comprised the South Carolina delegation, they managed to have some influence by working and voting as a cohesive bloc. Adolphus, that, that district has, as you mentioned, Tom Rice is the Republican candidate. The Democratic candidate is Gloria Tanubo. She's an African-American. Uh, she's already served in, in uh, legislative roles in the state of Georgia, moved back to her home state of, of South Carolina. Uh, is there any possibility that there'd be an African-American woman le elected in that district? It's, it's hard to say. Um, in looking at some of the numbers, like I said earlier, that came out of the Winther poll while she was running, she was running an appreciable distance behind the Republican candidate Rice. And that means that someone has to turn out a really significant ground game to get people out in order to overcome that kind of gap. So if there were something that were taking place at the top of the ticket that was going to bring more Democrats into the, into the polls, then that would help her. Unfortunately, we well, don't see that What about a guy named Obama ticket. at the top of the ticket? Does that not help but her? It's, when I think back to 2008, it was noted that, or it was projected that Barack Obama would lose South Carolina by 20 points. He actually lost South Carolina by 10. And that was a tremendous ground game on his part, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. What we've seen this time around is that some of that enthusiasm just wasn't there. We go back to 2008. Barack Obama had to spend time in this state because it was an early primary state on the Democratic column, and he was able to build relationships, cultivate relationships, speak to people around the state, develop some enthusiasm. He hasn't been here this time around because he hasn't had to come here. And I think that's going to hurt other Democrats down the ticket. Good points. Thank you. Uh, moving back to the round table, it's round so we can move people in and out as swiftly as possible. No corners to hit your, uh, hit your knees on. We're joined now by Amanda Loveday, who is the executive director of the state Democratic Party, and Matt Moore, who has the same role with the state Republican Party. So let's pick up on, on some of the, the local issues first. What's moving South Carolina these days? What issues are key? Um, I think education. I think making sure that we are educating our citizens as well as possible. I think that making sure that they're taking home as much as possible to feed their families. Um, but I also think what's really important is that we make sure that we elect officials to the state house to make sure that this kind of corruption that we've seen within the Republican Party in the state house um, doesn't fill our state house again yet in January. Those were broad terms up until the last. <laughs> What, what would you say are the moving issues? David Bauer, the top three issues are jobs, jobs, and jobs. You see it in exit polling. Uh, people are concerned about their families, about their paychecks. Uh, we've got a, a president here who's going to lose tonight in South Carolina because he hasn't uh, taken care of things here in South Carolina. He's fought us at every turn on Boeing, uh, on an NLRB, and a, a host of other issues. 
immigration reform and those kinds of things. So uh, it's no surprise that uh, you know he'll lose tonight by a big margin here. Well, no, you're right. It's no surprise. Do you want to pick up on that 7th Congressional District? Sure. Uh, Tom Rice is a, is a businessman, uh, a tax attorney from, from Myrtle Beach. Uh, of course, this is a new district, 70-plus uh, years of, of no 7th District in South Carolina. Uh, I, I expect Tom Rice to win tonight by about 7 to 10 points. I think uh, even smart Democrats agree. I'm not sure Amanda will or not. Uh, but uh, it's a race where the, the structurally the district uh, certainly suits the Republican Party, and we're going to win tonight. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a lead less than what it was running at uh, only a couple of weeks ago. Seventh Congressional District, was this the one and only chance for the Democrats to capture a new district? Um, I think it's the best chance for us to capture a new di district for sure. And I think Dr. Tanubu is a great candidate. I think she's very intelligent. I think that sending an economist to Washington is probably the best chance we have of making sure that we bring these jobs, jobs, jobs to South Carolina. Um, but it's, it's going to be a tight race, no question. Uh, but the Tanubu campaign has absolutely run an amazing race. Um, they know how to get the vote out. Uh, they're following the Obama turnout model. Um, so don't be surprised for an upset tonight. Ah, we'll watch. Let's move ahead just a little bit because as soon as the races are over tonight, we start on the 2014 campaign in state and we start on the 2016 campaign much more broadly. Um, I, I know this because people start thinking, should I run in 2016? So uh, given your positions heading up the, the, the two state parties, Amanda, where do you see this election setting the table for 14 for the governorship? I mean, I think that it starts immediately. I think that we start talking about um, who will be running in 14. Um, we have... Uh, Names? I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally would love a, a Haley Shaheen matchup again. I think that it was so close in 2010 that it could absolutely um, go our way this time with, with the poor uh, responsibility she's taken with our state as being governor over the past two years. Um, but I think 14 is going to be exciting. I think you're right, 16 is absolutely going to be exciting. Um, at the Democratic National Convention in Charlotte, I had numerous uh, national politicians come up to me and say, I look forward to seeing you over the next few years. Seeing you very uh, shortly. Absolutely. Uh, 14 first. Uh, there, there's never a break in politics. We know that. And I think our families would be sad to probably know that tonight. <laughs> uh, we, we flip tomorrow to 2014. Uh, we, we've got a good story to tell. Governor uh, running for re-election? Uh, yes, we've got a good story to tell with our constitutional officers. Curtis Loftus is on later. Of course, Governor Haley. Uh, a, a good jobs record. And Tre Treasurer Loftus uh, will be on. A great record, a great record on uh, kind of reforming the nuts and bolts of government. Uh, Al Alan Wilson, great attorney general. We've got a good story to tell. Let's say that uh, Mitt Romney does not win tonight, and the Republicans start positioning themselves for the next round. And of course, they look to Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. What are our Republicans going to be looking for if Mitt was not the answer? Uh, I, th I, think, I think you'll see a campaign start here pretty quickly. We've already seen over the past year so, uh, politicians coming in. Uh, Marco Rubio is one of them. Uh, and of course, a number of others visited with us at national conventions. So uh, they're, they're well aware nationally, uh, these, these uh, representatives and senators and other governors. South Carolina is a place you've got to win. Uh, I think uh, maybe they'll think outside the box a bit. You've got to kind of appeal now with, with, with the grueling primary process that we saw. I think that'll be kind of reformed now, uh, hopefully a little bit in 2016. That it may be too grueling to some. Okay, uh, let, let the campaigns begin, but not that's right. right. That's right. <laughs> not, not right now. Um, one of the things, and I'm, I'm going to shift gears here, one of the things that has, has changed is we're seeing more early voting. We're seeing uh, variations on the way people can vote absentee. We want to take a look at that and some of the, some of the changes that are taking place. We set an absentee voting record this year. Uh, approximately 400,000 absentee ballots cast. We don't have the final numbers on that, but I'm expecting it to be in the 400,000 range. 2008, we set a record at 342,000. Prior to that, the highest uh, number of absentee ballots cast in any election was about 160,000. So it, uh, it more than doubled in 2008, and then, and then we shattered the 08 record this year. So um, that shows that South Carolinians are energized about voting in this election. And that's carried over to Election Day because every um, indication we have and the anecdotal reports coming in from the polling places is that, is that turnout is just tremendous. And I think that um, that could lead us to a, a record-setting turnout today. I would certainly think that we would see something in the upper reaches of what we see in presidential elections. Um, that range is usually 63 to 76 percent. I think we would be in the upper level of that and possibly a new record, but we'll just have to wait, wait and see on that. 
All right, back here, while we were watching that piece of tape, the Associated Press called West Virginia, state of West Virginia for Mitt Romney. So uh, recapping three states so far, Kentucky and West Virginia for Romney, Vermont for Obama. We're joined now by uh, State Treasurer Curtis Loftus. And uh, oh, oh, that's enough introduction. We can get right down to some of the things that we were, we were talking about here. What's the mood in the state of South Carolina? I think it's an emotional mood. You know, there's a real visceral reaction from both sides. You know, people are really geared up. They're looking for uh, their interest to be looked after. And um, I think, you know, Republicans are really voting Republicans and uh, Democrats are voting Democratic. And they're excited. Well, the lines were, show that. You were, the, the lines are long. You were uh, an early supporter of Mitt Romney. You were his South Carolina chair. Um, at times he struggled. What, what might he have done, thinking more on a national campaign, but he, he struggled here and did not win the primary. What might he have done more? Well, it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've said this, I've had this conversation with him. He's not a great politician. He doesn't like staying around talking about nothing, which a lot of times <laughs> politics is about. He's a guy who likes the serious nuts and bolts of, of a project. His entire life's been about service, and to be the President of the United States is the ultimate platform for service. And so he's got to endure all this to get there. What, um, what do you think are the troublesome issues where, where people really want to see Romney step up? Well, you, you know, he, he, can, he is perceived by some to be aloof. Uh, and that's because he's always thinking. You know, I spent a lot of time with him. We'd be on the back of the bus talking about things. And it was never a trivial conversation. It was never what we saw on TV or Fox or CNN. It was always something meaningful. And so I think he has, uh, sometimes it's difficult for him just to go out to a crowd of people and tell them what they want to hear. And that's the base nature of politics these days. Can, can he, or can you for that matter, say that the economy is, is writing itself at this point? Uh, you're the state treasurer. You have to, you have to watch the, uh, the inflow and, and the expenditures. Things are not good. All around the world, things are not good. And the central banks are keeping us alive now, both in Europe and here in America. Uh, the, the amount of debt that's being floated all around the world is tremendous. So uh, we're in a little bubble. The times are not looking good in, in the future. What kind of bubble of which, which well, sort? Well, you know, uh, the president of the European Union said that we will do what it takes to keep the, the euro afloat. And Bernanke said the same thing. As long as it takes, we'll, we'll continue uh, QE3. So it's problematic. You've got countries out there, the, the, the most progressive, if you will, are floating all the debt. You go to the BRIC countries, you go to China, Russia, Brazil, places like that, they have positive accounts. We're terribly in debt. So the world's upside down and it's not going to play out well. When you see uh, things like the Midlands transportation tax, local referendum in, in, in that fashion, are those good things? I, I don't think so. I think the plan is ill-defined. I think it's a lot of special interests there are going to grab part of that penny. As soon as they do it, Lexington County will jump out because they'll want to uh, be, uh, have that extra penny as well. And they'll still be one penny behind Richland County. It's an escalation of fees. And I'm in government now. I see the nuts and bolts of it. We don't deserve more money. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not one of these folks who says no taxes any time. I'm pretty, pretty reasonable about those things for a Republican. But we've got to do better as, as far as how we manage our money. And Richland County just doesn't do a good job. All right, we're going to drop that at this point and, and, and move on. Thanks very much for being with us, Treasurer Loftus. Good to see you again. Yes, sir. Uh, let's go back to the, uh, what did we decide to call you, the Web Patrol, the Twitter Patrol? <laughs> the Twitter Patrol. We're on patrol. Uh, we were talking earlier about the new uh, congressional district in South Carolina, the 7th District. Uh, that's about the only district that really has a uh, competition going on right now. We don't have any senators up for re-election in South Carolina, but there are some key Senate races around the country, and we've been following a few of those on Twitter. So, Jenny, what have you been finding out? Virginia. Virginia. Very, very tight race, way too close to call. Right now, with only 2% of the precincts reporting, George Allen has a very small lead, but you know, that can't really predict the whole state. Um, both of them are pretty popular former governors, so that's definitely one to keep your eye on. And George Allen is the Republican in this race. Yes. And of course, the Republicans are a minority in the Senate right now, trying to recapture a majority. Um, at what's going on in uh, another key state, Indiana? Well, two of the big Senate races we have tonight are Missouri and Indiana. Missouri, we have Todd Akin, and in um, Indiana, we have Richard Murdoch, both GOP candidates. Both have made controversial comments about rape and abortion over the past couple of weeks. And um, what we're seeing is Missouri pools are still open, um, so nothing out of there yet. But in Indiana, very early reporting, about 8% reporting. Right now, Murdoch is down to his Democratic challenger, 
49-45%. Um, saw an interesting tweet. Murdoch race could be a bellwether for the Senate makeup. Are we going more right ideologically? Are we going more left? But um, we'll have to see those, res those results. Key race in Indiana. Now, Charles, Thank you. another guest. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rapid fire show here tonight. Lots to talk about in this one hour. Let me take a minute first with, with Scott Huffman and, uh, from, from uh, Winthrop. What are you, what are you hearing that, uh, in, the, in the course of the evening or what you're watching that, uh, that strikes your fancy? Well, you know, as expected, a lot of the, the early states are, are for Romney. Um, you know, they were where Romney had a, a very strong lead. Um, where Obama is uh, running well, it is incredibly close. Um, I mean, the, the numbers coming in are just making it a toss-up. Florida is going to be an absolute toss-up at this point. Uh, so is Ohio. Um, Virginia, we'll, we'll have to see. North Carolina, you know, is, is just going to be coming in soon. Well, one interesting thing is, and this will segue, I guess, into Congressman Clyburn, is I think the House is going to remain in Republican hands with roughly the same balance. You're going to have a few coming in, a few exiting, had some key retirements. Um, the Senate is probably going to remain in Democratic hands. The question is, will it stay at about 53 or could it drop down to 51? Um, those fortunes changed very recently with, uh, you know, Senatorial candidate Aiken, that was definitely right. going to go. There have uh, been a couple Republican. who have shot themselves in the foot. I Absolutely. Think, right? And so, um, you know, part of the question then becomes what is the balance going to be in the House? How many Tea Party Republicans are going to be left in the House? How many are going to struggle to keep their seats? And what will that mean if Obama wins as far as working with the administration goes forward? All right. When Scott hands me a segue, I take it. <laughs> Congressman Jim Clyburn joins us next. Congressman, thank you for joining oh, us. Thanks for having me. Um, so, what, so, what do you see uh, the, the shape of Congress being at the end of this? I think I agree. There will probably. Uh, remain the way we are. Um, I think it's a good possibility that the uh, uh, Democrats might even uh, pick up uh, a seat uh, on the Senate side. The Senate side? Which and, one? Um, and, uh, which and, one? And anyone in particular? Well, uh, I, I think uh, no one expected Donnelly uh, to win, and I believe Donnelly is going to win in Indiana. Um, uh, I uh, think uh, uh, McCaskill. Is that, is that retribution for kicking Dick Lugar out? Uh, that, yes. Some of that is absolutely that. But a lot of it has to do with um, whether or not the, the good Lord condones rape. Uh, and that was the big issue there. Uh, and we had a similar issue over in Missouri that I think would have gone uh, to the Republicans. Um, and I think this, the pickup that I'm expecting uh, that might occur uh, is in Wisconsin, though that's a hole for us uh, Democrats. It's a seat that we ex expected to go the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, Tammy Baldwin is running relatively well there. If she pulls it out, then I think that's the seat that will give us the plus one. What about the seventh congressional district here in South Carolina? We were talking about it mm -hmm. earlier. Um, are, are you disappointed? Disappointed with with the way it seems like it's going. Uh, a win for oh. Rice over Tanubu. Oh, I expected that. Um, I know who drew, drew the lines. Uh, I saw the lines when they were drawn. I. You know, I'm 72 years old. I've been in this state all my life. Uh, I, I know this state very, very well. Uh, and I know the precincts. Remember, um, Marion County was in my district. Uh, all, uh, Florence was in my district. Uh, I lost Florence, Marion, uh, except for Lake City uh, in Florence. And I lost uh, uh, parts of Georgetown uh, to that district. So I know the district very well. Neither Rice nor Tanubu was the uh, anticipated uh, sort, of, sort of party chosen candidate. Absolutely. Uh, both uh, Absolutely. upset in, in broad fields. That's quite true. But, but that didn't create uh, enough of an opportunity for the Democrats. No, no. What, um, how much of this is a referendum on Barack Obama? Oh, the whole campaign uh, is a referen uh, referendum. Uh, but I think that what you uh, see uh, is that uh, this referendum is not what everybody thought it would be. I think the, the more we got into this campaign, people began to accept the fact uh, that uh, Barack Obama uh, has been a very good president. Uh, all you've got to do is look at exactly where we were. And when people say, oh, are we better off today than we were uh, four years ago, we are much, much, much better off than we were four years ago. I was in that room. Uh, when uh, Paulson came in uh, to give his report that we were on the verge of collapsing and it was going to be worse than it was 
1929. So you would refute the point that the Republicans are making that there are more unemployed today than there were when, when uh, Barack Obama took office? There are more unemployed today than Barack Obama took office, but he took office uh, on a, in a month when we lost 740,000 jobs. And the month before he took office, we lost another 700,000 jobs. We lost 2.1 million jobs in the 90 days in the run-up to his being sworn in. Uh, and so what do you expect? I mean, if you jettison uh, 800,000 jobs a month, uh, at some point in time, you got to stabilize the stuff. So no one expected him to step up and raise some kind of magic wand, and the next morning, you would stop losing jobs. So I think that people are realistic about that. I'm, I'm reminded in some ways of, of the slowly turning economy in 1992 when, when George H.W. Bush, Bush right. 41, was running for re-election and kept saying the economy's <laughs> turning, the economy's turning. It was, but extremely slowly. Right. And, and the, the electorate said, not fast enough for us. Absolutely. Is there a reasonable parallel here? Yes, there is. And uh, that's why I'm so anxious about this election, because I know that whoever is sworn in in January it will reap the benefits of a robust economy. And that's why I want this president to get, be reelected today because I think he's deserving uh, of getting the credit for a robust economy because he's sure enough got more uh, than his share of blame for us being where we are today. But the good, so he's the good news is that the economy is more robust regardless of who's president. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's who, who, who's ever in the office gets the credit. You, you, you know, inevitably, we get to Election Day 2012, and we start thinking immediately, or <laughs> within a split second, what happens in 2016? Barack Obama's not going to be running one way or another. No. So, uh, so what, what's your, what's your uh, uh, long-range view of the Democratic candidates? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, you'll have to wait to see what Hillary... Uh, uh, Clinton does. You have to wait to see what uh, Vice President Biden uh, will do. We don't know uh, yet. So he was rather coy when he voted today. He didn't. He didn't allow that this was the last time he'd vote for himself. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't blame him for being coy. Would you like to see Hillary Clinton run? Well, it'd be fine with me. Um, I, I know both those people very well, uh, and I, I consider both of them good friends, and I mean that in the sincere sense, not the political sense. Uh, Joe Biden and I go back, uh, way, way back. Uh, I started working with Hillary Clinton when she was trying to do health care uh, in the first year uh, of uh, President Clinton's uh, administration. And I consider her a very close uh, friend, and in some instances, a, a confidant. As, as the evening wraps up, what are you watching? What, what's key for you? Key for me is Ohio, Florida, uh, Virginia, uh, Wisconsin. Um, uh, those four, because I, an hour too, but I, I, I think we're holding an hour. I'm very, very concerned about Ohio because I was in Ohio Friday. I, I, I did five states in five days in the run up until Sunday. And I'm going to tell you uh, what I see going on in, in Ohio, I just absolutely am appalled. Uh, at a, an elected official uh, doing the kind of things the Secretary of State is doing uh, in Ohio, all designed uh, to subvert the political process. In, in what respect, Congressman? Well, let me give one good example. In Ohio, there's a law that no more than, uh, uh, no one precinct should have more, more than 1,400 voters in it. So in Ohio, uh, in one particular area, I was in Akron, uh, and in that area, uh, 15, uh, precinct 15, 16, 17, 700, I'm sorry, 1,400 votes each. So what does he do? He collapsed all three of them into one voting place. Into one voting place. So the precincts got... So they got long lines there, right? Absolutely. Long That's over 4,000 people he's throwing into one voting place. Now that is very, very uh, uh, unusual. And people uh, will be able to see through that. But I'm going to tell you what's happening. Well, the key is that they get to vote. We're, we're about out of time here. But you go ahead. Tell me well, what's happening. Well, what's happening here in South Carolina, I saw people, and I know these precincts very well in Richland County. I saw people in those lines today under 30 that I've never seen vote before. And I've talked to the precinct people, and they're telling me none of these people have ever voted before, though they live in that precinct. 
Good. Congressman Clymer, thanks very much. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. Uh, Adolphus, let's go back to you and and uh, take take the, the point that uh, that the congressman was just making, uh, the demographics of, of the electorate, uh, younger people. Are you seeing that as well? This is something we have to keep in mind about what's happening this time around. I think when we go back to 2010, there was a lot of concern about the Republican Party and if the Republican Party was on its last legs. Then they get this big boost in 10, but the electorate for a midterm election is very different from the electorate for general election. When we look at what's been happening in the national electorate over the last several election cycles, it's, been, it's becoming more and more racially and ethnically diverse. The percentage of the electorate comprised by whites has been declining by about one or two percentage points over the last several contests. And the percentage comprised of African Americans, Latinos, Asian and Pacific Islanders, that's been increasing. It's part of the reason why in some particular states, the demographic patterns have been favoring the Democratic Party because they've been able to reach out to those college educated whites and the larger populations of racial and ethnic minorities that live around urban centers. I think this has also prompted more serious Republicans to think about the nature of their electoral coalition going forward. I can recall remarks from Senator Graham in one of the Washington papers saying that, you know, we can't win by simply appealing to old angry white guys, that we're going to have to do something better to remain more competitive. Scott? Well, you know, Adolphus points out a great um, a concept about the, the, the turnout demographics. As we look at it, it is changing fundamentally. But the key is, is it changing in certain places? I was just looking through some tweets that said that uh, uh, turnout among whites in Ohio is actually much lower than it's been in a very long time. And you also look at some exit polling data that's showing that the bailout is among the most important things to some folks in Ohio. Then that could make a state like Ohio go for Obama. And a lot of this, though comes down to who's setting the laws and as Congressman Clyburn pointed out, who's drawing the lines. He made a great point about the, the 7th Congressional District. Um, as originally drawn, that was going to be over 30 uh, percent BVAP, black uh, voting age population. Um, at the one that got substituted in that was voted on that uh, then Senator McConnell had a, a great hand at, at substituting in really helped the Republicans got the black voting age population below 30 percent, made it very difficult for anything other than a moderate Republican to get in. So this and type that's, of, and that's what you get in the practice exactly of redistricting. That's what you get in, yes. in redistricting, and the turnout among these key constituencies is going to be very important. The Hispanic turnout in Florida, the non-Cuban Hispanic turnout in Florida, um, at how much minorities are having trouble getting to the polls, and in Ohio, the white turnout and the turnout among those who see the auto bailout as crucial. Are, are we seeing that difficulties getting to the polls, or, or, is, or is this sort of a only an, anecdotal an, an, an evidence? An we, we've mm -hmm. seen you know reports here and there, but we've seen absolutely nothing solid yet that that I think we can rely on. Um, so here we are, nearly wrapped up through our hour. Um, what are you going to have your eye on the, the rest of the evening? Like everybody else, I'm going to have my eye on Florida. Um, if Obama wins Florida, then Romney has a very, very narrow path to victory. He's got to get Ohio, and he's got to get virtually every other swing state, you know, from Colorado to Nevada to Iowa to New Hampshire. Um, if Romney can pick up Florida, that gives him a little bit more flexibility, even if uh, Obama gets um, uh, Ohio. Pennsylvania is going to be key because the Romney campaign had always seen Pennsylvania as a possible substitute. Uh, Ohio right now has 18, Pennsylvania has 20 electoral college votes, and so there was the hope if, if the Romney campaign loses Ohio that they can substitute with uh, Pennsylvania. But as the votes come in in Colorado, in Wisconsin, in Iowa, in New Hampshire, in Florida, in Ohio, before the West Coast starts chiming in, if, o if uh, Romney loses Florida and Ohio and Pennsylvania, there's almost no way he can win it. One more state to report, and while it's not a huge surprise, uh, it's close to our hearts. PBS is calling the state of South Carolina for Mitt Romney. Let's go back to, to, to Brent and uh, uh, as well as, as Jenny and Amit, whom, whom I must say um, are outstanding students in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. A shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Charles. Uh, yes, we've enjoyed following Twitter, and Scott has uh, told us a little bit about how you can find out things like, what's the turnout in Ohio? And you see that on Twitter. But I want to ask these two uh, students, exactly how does social media 
connect you all in, in this new age. Amit, do you want to take a shot at that? Well, I think just looking at Twitter in particular over the course of the campaign, I think in our generation, it's been a big tool to mobilize the vote. Uh, my friends and I, we do talk about political stuff sometimes on Twitter. And um, I noticed today in particular, not a lot of vote Romney or vote Obama stuff, but just go out and vote, perform your civic duty. So with Twitter being something, just look at it real quick, it really has improved how much we vote I believe. And Jenny, how does it connect your world? I think it makes it so much more accessible. You know, if you're out on the town doing something and you can't make it to a debate to watch it on TV, you can almost watch it on your phone. You can see all the memorable moments, the, the big bird moments, the binders full of women, the horses and bayonets. You see that all on Twitter and you have Excellent. it all right there. <laughs> well, thank both of you. I thank both of you for being here tonight and helping us follow on Twitter. And thank you, Charles. It's been great. Thank you, Brent. Uh, Adolphus, final thoughts before we get to sit back and watch all the returns come in. Adolphus? I think I'm with the Twitter team. I think I'm with the Twitter team. I'm looking at Flova, and I'm, wa I'm watching to see if the president can succeed in building a Midwest firewall. All right, we're, we're all with the Twitter team. Scott, final thoughts. you got about 30 seconds. Uh, absolutely. You know, again, it, it's going to be a referendum on sort of the, the future of polling is one thing. And of course, as somebody who polls, I'm going to be looking at that very closely. So I'm very interested in how these samples are going to stack up. But also as a South Carolinian, I'm really interested. This is going to be a once in a lifetime thing where you have all of these petition candidates. Um, I want to know how it impacts straight ticket voting. A lot of these petition candidates may not win, but they may impact the propensity to vote straight tickets. So it's all going to be interesting to watch as an analyst, maybe not so fun as a party. Well, it's all interesting and it's all important. As one who's covered uh, a lot of presidential campaigns and political campaigns, uh, to dismiss it at any point in time as, as uh, not consequential is, is to make a big mistake. So and I think it was evident seeing the numbers of people who were uh, uh, quite patiently waiting and eager to cast their votes, even in elections in states where we kind of know how it's going to come out. But we don't know all that's going to happen. So stay tuned to your local PBS station. The News Hour will be covering uh, the rest of the evening. I want to thank all our guests for being with us tonight for in-depth and up-to-the-minute information on the evening's programs. Stay with ETV.